Did you know that you have a link to the Nottingham Panthers? No. Do you want to take a guess at what it is? I don't know if I do. Like, my parents are from England. Um, my dad grew up, like, in Swinton, like, close to Manchester. Okay, it's not that. It's, it's, uh, it involves it's not battle, my parents. You know, it involves Battle of the Blades. Battle of the Blades? You, you, one of your f- contest, fellow contestants was a, not- a former Nottingham Panther. Okay. Um, Colt Noor? PJ Stock? Nope. Bruno? Brian McGratton. Oh, Brian McGratton. Big oh, well, that was my, my next choice. <laughs> <laughs> I like how he was the last one you expected to be in Nottingham. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was Do you really- see all the big fighters? I was, I was getting really worried then, like, oh, maybe she wasn't on the one with Brian McGrath. Did I read the wrong thing? <laughs> no, I <it> was. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I am very relieved now. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know he, he played there. Yeah, he, played for, he played here for one season. Came over okay. with, his t- with his tinted visor and, and everything. So yeah. actually, the hockey world is very big and very small at the same time. So you do have some kind of link back to us. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. Did, did you have much interaction with Brian on the show? Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, um, at first, like we were paired up to skate, like not actually skate together, but like our, like we would share the ice, like end zones. Um, so I probably got to know him and his partner first. And then, yeah, like, I mean, throughout the show, like as long as he was on it, like once he got kicked off, then he was gone for a bit. But um, yeah, while he was on it, like we saw pretty much everyone almost every day. So what, what, what was he like on the show? Because I remember when we had him here, he, he, would, he, got, he got into a very strange relationship with our biggest rival, Sheffield, and he did this one goal where he scored against them, went, then went celebrating down towards their fans, and it was like watching Bambi on ice go down the other end. Um, I mean, at first it was kind of intimidating because like when he played, he was just kind of like a big fighter guy, like kind of like the undertaker, you know, like he was kind of, <laughs> kind of scary, but um, he's actually super nice like pretty soft for such a big guy um but yeah it was interesting seeing him trying to figure skate and being such a big guy like as soon as he put his skates on and stood up I was like dying laughing and he, like like him and Colt Nora were wearing like tights like at first and I was like oh my gosh like this is just gonna be hilarious like how how are they gonna move out there <laughs> it's, the, that is, it's their reputation shot at that point he's this big scary guy with his tinted visor and he goes on there They're and by all the accounts all and by all accounts, he smashes it on there as well. Yeah. I know everyone was good. <laughs> like picked it up pretty quick. I remember, I remember we were, he, he posted something and we were sharing, we were trying to keep him in the competition from over here by getting our fans to vote on his behalf from, yeah. <laughs> from the UK. Obviously we didn't, we didn't succeed, but we tried. <laughs> yep. So where did ice hockey come into the life of, obviously you grew up in, Canada so ice hockey is an integral part of growing up but where did ice hockey do you remember it coming into your life um okay so like kind of I guess maybe a little bit by chance like my my dad grew up um in Swinton like just outside of Manchester my mom was from Newcastle and when they got married my dad got a job in Canada so they ended up moving to Canada um and then I have three older brothers so my oldest brother um we were all born in Canada so my oldest brother uh they so my dad was a rugby player and he was like, my kids aren't going to play any contact sports. So they're all going to play soccer. So he put us into soccer, but all the kids who play soccer in the summers in Canada play hockey in the winters. So my brother obviously wanted to play with his friends in the winter. So he got into hockey and then we just kind of all followed suit playing soccer, or I guess you call it football, um, uh, soccer and hockey. And then we all ended up obviously being better at hockey, but yeah, just kind of, kept going like that and stuck with it. Do you remember the first team you played for? Yeah, so I first played just like for my community team. It was called the West Hill Golden Hawks and it was a boys team, but I actually quit after my first year um, and just still went to power skating. And then I joined a girls team that was called Durham West Lightning. Uh, and, and when you're playing with the boys team, was, were you on par with those guys? Like, were you, I'm guessing you weren't out of place kind of thing. Yeah, we would have been like four or five. So oh, okay. I, we were all pretty even like I may have even been a better skater because like in the in the winters my dad always made like an outdoor rink so I was always skating around with my brothers 
Um, I did like a lot of power skating growing up. So I, I think my dad just tried to like get me on the ice as much as I could. <laughs> did you do all the outdoor skating and things like that on lakes and things when you were growing up then? No, not really like many lakes or ponds. Like it was mostly like just the backyard. Like my dad would just flood with the hose, like the backyard and we just kind of have like a little rink back there. And say, so was it always hockey for you? Or could you have chosen another sport? No, I could have chosen. Like I love soccer too. Um, and I mean, in high school, I did like every sport I did. I mean, volleyball, I did field hockey. Um, I did badminton. I did cross country. I did track. So um, really any of them, but I mean, I always loved hockey. Like I always felt like, um, you know, like when you skate down the ice, you get like the breeze through your hair and just like the wind in your face. And I feel like you kind of feel free and you kind of forget everything else that's going on. And it's just like a lot of fun. So I think I always loved like skating on the ice and I always love scoring goals. Um, so I think I just came to, to love it. I was like, if you always love scoring goals, I'm guessing it was always forward for you. Then there's no chance of you playing defense. No, I, when I played house league, I had to play goalie once and I thought I was going to be so good. And I think this was probably when I was like five again. So don't judge me, but I thought I was good. And then the puck was coming down and I was like, I went to stop it to like pass it out to my player. And the puck went through, through my fly hole and in. And then I was like, no more goalie for me. <laughs> I'll stick to forward. <laughs> Uh, and then in a little bit of research I did before this, and you can obviously, you always believe everything you read on the internet. So I'm, I'm going with what I read. Okay. When you had choice of colleges, apparently you had 30 colleges that you could have gone to. Wow. Where? That's, that that's what your, that's what that your, your Wikipedia page says you had 30 colleges vying for you to go to them. Oh man. Um, I don't know where that came from, but yeah, there was, I mean, quite a few of like letters came in and I eventually narrowed it down. Um, I went on, I think, four official visits and then decided on Ohio State. Um, I mean, I loved it there. I love my unofficial and my official visit there. So it just felt like the right place. What was it about Ohio State that made you think this is the one for me? Yeah. So like my oldest brother played at Wisconsin. So my whole time growing up, like I thought I was going to be a Badger and I thought I was going to go to Wisconsin. And then my mom was like, let's just go visit another big school and just see what it's like. Um, so you can get the feel and see if you like the big schools. And then I visited Ohio State. And like, as soon as I got on the campus, I was like, wow, like, it's like a movie. <laughs> you know, it's like what you'd see on a movie. So I was like, I love it. And um, when I went on my official visit, Tessa Bonham was there who had played um, in the 2010 Olympics. And I got to stay with her and she kind of showed me around. Um, and I just had so much fun. I, I loved the girls that were playing there. Um, yeah, I just loved like the whole atmosphere of the school, like how much they loved their sports teams. Um, but also the support that they had for school, um, you know, your education. So I just decided kind of, I, um, I mean, I think I knew most of the time that was going to be um, the place I was going to end up was Ohio State. But yeah, I definitely looked at a few others, but still came back to Ohio State. I loved it. But not 30. You didn't go to 30. No, I didn't visit 30. No, 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 <laughs> no. And then you I mentioned a whole year of travel. <laughs> at least you get to see some different places. Yeah. You mentioned Tessa there. What, what players did you uh, like look up to when you were growing up kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, at first it was just like my brothers. I, they were the only ones that I really saw. Um, you know, I watched the NHL, I thought, because they wanted to play in the NHL, I was going to play in the NHL too. Um, but when I was around 11, I went to a hockey school and I got to meet Jennifer Botterill. Um, she played at many Olympics for Team Canada and was an amazing player. And I got to see her gold medal um and get some pictures with her and I think that that was kind of the moment where I was like wow like I could be like her and she's a real person and um I can keep playing hockey until I'm older uh so I think it was it was really her that kind of sparked that dream and then going to watch Team Canada and like see Haley Wickenheiser skating down the ice and being so fast and so good um Carolyn Willett the Jana Heffert like all of them I think were players that I looked up to and then when I got the chance to play with them, I was kind of like, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> is that kind of like when you walk into the locker room, you're like, I can't believe she's actually there. Yeah. And then like you, you think that they're kind of intimidating at first again. And then the 2014 Olympics, like Wickenheiser was my line mate. So like we became really good friends. And now just like knowing her, it's like, well, she's like so nice and like not really someone that like you should be intimidated of. Like obviously she's intense. And like when she gets into the game, she's like very intense. But um, no, we got along really well. 
and say, well, and because I, I do this all the time, I go back and forth between questions and then jump all over the place. So I'm going yeah, back yeah. to, I'm going back to college now because I, I get distracted like a magpie. I just like, it's something <laughs> shiny shows if I go with it. But when you're at, uh, when you're at Ohio, is there any moments that stand out from your time at Ohio that you like look back on fondly? Ooh, I mean, there's so many moments, like a lot of them, I think would be moments that like weren't even hockey related. Like I think I had so many amazing experiences with my teammates. Um, but probably was my junior year. Um, we beat Wisconsin out um, to go to the final four, which would have just been like the WCHA title. Um, and we took Minnesota to like triple overtime, but we ended up losing. Um, but that was probably a highlight. Um, what else? I mean, there was, there was, it was so much fun. Like just my teammates, like I still keep in touch with all my teammates. Um, you know, now during this time we have some zoom calls mm. and stuff. So it's, I mean, it's just really cool to, to get to get your education, but also get to play um, with players who have like the same goals and um, just love hockey as much as you do. And what does a triple overtime do to the body? That can't, I imagine at the time you, you don't really feel it, but afterwards I imagine yeah. you feel it. Yeah, I mean, I was young then, so I was just ready to go. But um, yeah, it definitely, it was a long game. Like it was almost two games in a row. So uh, it, was, it was really crazy. Well, you're the same age as me, so you're still young. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> and then after college, you get you go into the CWHL draft, which I imagine is quite a cool experience. Yeah. Um, obviously, Tessa Banam again had been drafted to the Toronto Furies um, four years prior, like that I got drafted. So, um, coming out and getting to be drafted by Toronto, where I grew up, um, was amazing. Uh, getting to play in that league, like professional women's hockey, it's something, you know. We, I guess I wasn't sure if it was going to be around um, or what was going to be kind of the options after university, but getting to play for that team and, and with some amazing players it was a lot of fun. And did you, when you went into that draft, did you get, did you have a, like, a hint that you were going to get drafted by your hometown team? Yeah, like you can kind of say like which area you'd rather be in. So like oh, I could okay. have get drafted by like Toronto or Brampton, um, but it worked out that it was Toronto. And things worked out quite well at Toronto. I think you set franchise rookie records in your first year there. And then second year you win um, the championship. Yeah. Yeah. My second year um, was actually the Olympic year. So I was gone the whole year. And I think Toronto like squeaked into the playoffs. And after the Olympics, they were like, are you going to come back and play? And I was like, I don't know if I should come back. Like, I don't want to take someone's spot that's been playing all year. They were like, no, just come back. So I was like the only player in Toronto to go back. And we ended up pulling out a miracle, really. <laughs> but it was, it was, that was like such a fun weekend of um, playing in the playoffs and then um, beating Boston in the finals. So, so were you not expected to win that finals then? No, I think we were like, there was, I don't know if it was five teams and we were fifth out of the five or we were like fourth out of the five teams. Um, and then, yeah, like Boston was stacked. It was pretty much like the whole U.S. Olympic, Olympic team. So then... Because over here, we don't have a professional uh, ice hockey, women's ice hockey league. We've only got 10 professional men's teams over here. So there was the, at one point, there was the two leagues, wasn't there? There's the CWHL and there's the North American, the American League as well. Yes. So the last year um, in April, the CWHL folded. Um, and then, so then last year, we also created the PWHPA, which is the Players uh, Professional Women's Hockey Association. Um, where we kind of went on a dream gap tour, we called it. So we went all over North America playing games, um, inner squad games pretty much just to showcase our game. Uh, we got to hit up like Philly, Arizona, places that don't see a lot of women's hockey either because they don't have women's teams, um, but they do have NHL teams. So it was really cool just to, to showcase that. And um, then getting to go to the NHL All-Star game and getting uh, to play in that three on three. I think that that was huge for women's hockey and just showcasing, you know, there is a market for our game out there. People do want to watch it. People want to see it. Um, so yeah, I think just even now we're still just continuing um, with our mission of, you know, hopefully creating a women's league um, that's viable, that's sustainable. And obviously as a player, I would love for it to be under the NHL umbrella and kind of like that WNBA setup, um, you know, where, they have the same buildings, um, marketing, all that. I think just to get us, um, you know, hit the ground running. And then I, I think that they'll realize that there is a big fan base that want to follow us and want to support us um, through all of that. 
And you can really tell there is that market for it, like you say, because when the Olympics rolls around, well, that, 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 everyone looks forward to that Canada women's Olympic game. That's always it's on like the, on the, the calendar. Watched, one of the most watched sports. So it's, there's definitely a market. People want to watch it. I think people just don't know how to access it non-Olympic years and it's not as accessible because they don't um, put as many on TV and stuff. So I think, um, you know, with the NHL on board, we'd be able to probably broadcast and use more of their broadcast rights and stuff and um, have more games online or on TV. So I think, yeah, that would be the best case scenario would be for them to come on board and, and to get that working. Well, you can see that with that with the WNBA and the NBA relationship where the WNBA puts, puts games on Twitter for free. I mean, that's, that's where I first came across the WNBA. And then you yeah. watch a WNBA game and front row at a Sparks game is LeBron James. So once, that, and once you get that relationship going, if you get Sidney Crosby at front row of a women's professional mm-hmm. game, that matters. That speaks to every fan. Yeah. And, and we've seen a lot of support from the men's players. Um, you know, they want it to happen. Um, they're not too sure, like, how they can exactly make it happen. And obviously, they're not high up in the NHL and, and you know, the business side of it. But they're definitely very supportive of our sport. And um, even at the All-Star game, they all were cheering us on and thought that it was awesome that we were there. So, um, you know, hopefully down the road, we can kind of have that same setup where we go watch the guys and they come watch us. I think it would be awesome. It's like where I saw the you're on Sportsnet with Mitch Marner the other day, and you could the way he spoke about that they were watching it in the back, but they weren't they wouldn't let them come out to the front to watch. It. You could tell that they that he really enjoyed watching that game. Yeah, I think yeah they were trying to like not have them distract us, so they weren't letting them come out. But um, I think yeah they said they were all just in the locker room watching it on TV, and obviously we had to put on a pretty good show and try because I mean it was our one shot to prove that. You know, there people do want to watch us, and it's entertaining. So I think uh, we did a good job of that too. Did you feel a Did you feel a groundswell of support after that? Yeah, I mean, I think even when they were announcing us coming out onto the ice, like there was huge cheers. Um, everyone that we saw around St. Louis, if you were carrying your hockey bag and sticks, they're like, "Oh, you guys were amazing the other night! Like, loved watching it." Uh, and I think, yeah, everyone that had watched it, and and I think a lot of people tuned in, said it was it was awesome showcase of women's hockey and the talent level. I think, you know, a lot of people think back maybe 20 years of what they saw of women's hockey and not how far it's come and it's growing so fast and it's getting better so fast. Um, you know, even the younger girls coming up are, are way better than I was at their age. So it's just going to keep improving. Um, and I think that it's, it's exciting for the future of women's hockey. It's just, you know, we're kind of in this, this make or break time where we need to fight for, you know, what we deserve and that's a women's professional league. It's like when, uh, to use it in more of a to bring that to a, a kind of British level, when the Women's World Cup happened in France last year, mm-hmm. ever since then, like women's football has just like taken off, especially mm-hmm. in the UK. Like the the because every every game that World Cup was put on free to air TV. Every like even if it was like Jamaica versus Portugal, it was on the telly, so you could tune yeah. in and watch all these games. And ever since then, the FA, the Football Association, you can watch the WSL, the Women's Super League on their website for free. So that they, they really built upon what the, the you know, like the grounds where you get from the Olympics, yes. they kind of built on that from the World Cup. Yeah. I mean, that would be amazing. I mean, we also were supposed to have our world championships this year in Halifax, which is in Canada. And it would have been amazing to have that home crowd, but obviously um, with Corona, it, it all got canceled. So we weren't able to play, but hopefully next year we can kind of build off that too. Um, that fan base and, and continue the momentum. Yeah, when, when everything gets back to normal, that's going to be the really important part of it all, isn't it? See, that, that's when everyone's, because everyone's going to go out and want to watch whatever. Then if you yes. can grab people's attention at that point, you'll have them forever. Yes. Yeah. I think people will be hungry for their sports. I think, you know, there's a lot of things we take for granted and now you realize you're really missing out on them. Yeah. Do you think you'll, you'll appreciate the game even more when it does come back after a time like this? Like even just watching it? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I think like as athletes, we, we love to play and, and we're on the ice so much that, you know, there's some mornings you wake up and you're like, oh, I just wish I could just stay home. And I don't think I'll, I'll think like that anymore. I think I'll be really grateful to go to the rink and, um, you know, to put in the work because there's times like this where you can't go to the rink and, you, you know, you can't see your teammates. Um, you know, you can't go training with them. So I think, yeah, just in the future, looking back on this, just know, knowing how grateful I am to be able to go to the rink and to be able to play the game I love. I imagine I'm playing the game you love. I imagine there's no greater stage you love playing it on than with the international team. 
yeah, I mean, I love playing with and, and against the best players in the world. So it's pretty crazy, um, you know, just to see the talent that our team has. And um, it doesn't matter, like, even the lines because everyone is so good. So uh, it's it's so much fun. Um, and then, yeah, obviously when we get to play the, the U.S., those are really intense games, um, but the most fun because they're the ones you want to play in. Is it strange that you go from, you know, almost fighting for that attention to then the spotlight being so burning bright on you at those Olympics where I imagine the press in Canada, it's these girls have to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of pressure. I mean, I think it's always gold or nothing. Um, and obviously in Pyeongchang when we won silver, it felt like such a disappointment. Um, but I think that there's been so many girls that have come before us that have um, really set that precedent and um, have been so successful. So we want to follow in their footsteps and we, you know, want to be successful just like they were. And we work hard for, you know, a lot of time leading up to that Olympics um, to be prepared for that game and, and to be the most ready that we can be. So um, it is disappointing when you don't win, but um, it's also a, a super exciting time for women's hockey when, when we get that exposure and when people get to watch those games and just see how intense, how back and forth, how fast the game is. Um, and I mean, every single Olympic final is so close. So uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting time, but also very intense and very stressful. I'd love to say if anyone wants if anyone wants to watch how exciting women's hockey is at that international standard, I think the that 2014 game from Sochi yeah. is on the Olympic Channel on YouTube in full. So be that that wow. is one of the craziest hockey games I think I've ever watched. And I went yeah. back and watched the highlights before I before we did this. And I okay. forgot just how crazy the ending of that game was. Yeah. The goal, then the puck hitting the post. That that puck hitting the post. The Oof. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the bench. I thought it was going in, and then it like turned at the last second. Whew. And what do you what do you remember the emotion being when that equalizer goes in? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of when we got that first goal, that we kind of felt the momentum shift, and they were kind of on their heels a bit, just trying to hold on to the lead. Um, but yeah, definitely, I remember looking around and seeing the older girls, and like they didn't almost seem like they were phased by this. Like they were so ready. Uh, for anything and I think the whole year we had been through a lot of adversity and we'd overcome a lot that we were really ready for that game for whatever was gonna be thrown at us um, but then yeah I guess when when we scored that tying goal it, it did feel like we had the momentum and we were going um, into overtime with with the momentum and we were like okay let's just finish it off as soon as we can and um, then they got a penalty we got the power play um, and Mary scored and Whew, the rest is history. I, I, I'm sure you. I'm sure your your heart would have preferred a nice five-one win, but there's no better way to win it than in overtime, is there? No, I mean, like it being my first Olympics too. Like it almost didn't feel real for a while because it just happened all so oh, all so fast. And like it was like the best day of my life getting that gold medal, but it was also like such a relief because we had worked so hard for that moment, um, and knowing that that we actually accomplished our goal was amazing. Um, but yeah, it was. It was so crazy that game and how it all happened. And I'm pretty sure you could just watch the last five minutes and be super entertained. I think it stopped, stopped like the whole world in its tracks, or at least Canada in its tracks, to just find a TV and watch that game. Yeah, that, that's a, that, I don't, that, even in all these, I've been watching the game in any game. That was to, to get the, the goal that went off the defenseman and then the one on the post. It was, just, it was almost destiny after that one hit the post. <laughs> yeah, the hockey gods were with us that, that game at the last five minutes. Do you, do you remember getting the call that you were in the Olympic squad? Because I imagine up to that Olympics, that's what you're working towards. You want to get in that Olympic team because that's the, the, mm. like the top level kind of. Do you remember getting the call that you were in there? So it actually wasn't a call. Like the way that we do tryouts here, um, like you obviously have to make the team every single year. But for the Olympic year, um, you have to move to Calgary. So move to like the other side of Canada. And okay. they bring about like 28 or 29 girls. And then it's about a six month long tryout. So you're playing games. Um, we play against boys teams all over Alberta. Um, so we played like 55 games in five months um, for a tryout. So that's like more than an NHL schedule. Plus we had like crazy training days stuff, but they can literally cut you at any time throughout those six months. Jesus. So it's like, you got to be on every single day. Um, but when they named the final team was December 21st. Um, so right before we would go home for Christmas, um, so like, that could ruin your Christmas very easily. It could ruin your Christmas really easily, yeah. So it was December 21st and we had these meetings and they were like set up already. And then I remember going in and the coach was across um, the table and he stood up and he put his hand out and he said, Spooner, are you ready to go overseas? 
And I just like burst into tears. Like it was, it was amazing. I remember calling my whole family being like, I made it. And they were already like all together for Christmas. So um, it was so much fun. And then I got to go join them for Christmas and then come back and then get ready. Um, we went over to Austria before Sochi for two weeks and then on to Sochi. So it was like pretty soon after we were gone um, to get ready for the Olympics. Yeah. And do you remember getting going getting to Sochi? Did it feel different to a world championships when you like got there? Because obviously in the world championships, you're still going up against the USA and the top teams kind of thing. But did it feel different? Oh. Yeah, totally different too, because like, I mean, at world championships, we just stay in a hotel and now you're like driving into like an Olympic village. Um, there's so many other athletes there. And I think like the one moment for me that I was like, wow, I'm really at the Olympics was the opening ceremonies mm -hmm. and getting to see all the other Canadian athletes. And obviously like we're a hockey team. We have, you know, 23 girls. It's a pretty big team, but now you're like, you're hundreds of red people in red and you're like a huge team Canada team. So just knowing um, you know, there's all these other athletes that are cheering you on and you're cheering them on. Um, and it's something that's so much bigger than, you know, just your own team. I thought that was a really cool moment and walking into the opening ceremonies and just not knowing where to look and waving and cheering. And it was, it was so cool. And then I imagine it's all about now working towards those Olympics in 2022 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So We'll have one more world championships next year. And then in May, we'll start with a boot camp, And then in August, like we'll be moving to Calgary again. Um, so yeah, just a year out before kind of our, our intense training, like as a team starts, because everyone's from all over Canada. So mm. we don't all play together um, year round, but then, yeah, we'll all come together um, to play. And they'll obviously, there'll be more than just the team because you got to make the team. So the, the long tryout will start again. <laughs> I'm sure you're looking forward to that process. For sure. I mean, it's stressful, but it's also so much fun. I mean, your teammates become your best friends and, um, you know, you get to work hard every day and feel like you're actually improving um, as a player, playing with, with the best players, um, you know, every single day. I imagine that everyone who was on that roster in, in Pyeongchang will be like foaming at the mouth to get into that squad to then reset everything back to how it should be with Canada as gold medalists. For sure. I mean... Yeah, that game was tough, like to lose in a shootout. I don't think it's, you know, a way that anyone wants to lose. But yeah, we didn't, we had a few people retire after that, but not too many. So I think, I think we're definitely really hungry um, to get back out there and to play the U.S. And uh, I think, you know, just that time that we'll have together before the Olympics, I think it, it does a lot for our team of, of bringing us together and, um, you know, building that team chemistry. So I know that the centralization will be really hungry. Um, you know, to, to bring the best team and to make sure that we're, um, you know, our, the best players that we can be for when that uh, gold medal game comes. And is that gold medal, gold medal winning moment, the, like, would you say that's the top moment in your career so far? For sure. Yeah, that day, that Sochi game, for sure. That was crazy. <laughs> Do you think anything will ever top that moment? Because it's your first Olympic Games as well. I don't, I mean, I don't know, like... Like, obviously, Pyeongchang doesn't top it because we lost. But, and, and Sochi was amazing because it was my first time. And, um, you know, we overcame a lot to win that. And I just think that team was so special. But I don't know. I can't say, like, maybe our team will just be, like, an, the most amazing team Team Canada have, has ever seen next Olympics. And, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I hope something tops it. Like, I hope I have that moment to look forward to. So, I'm I'm gonna go with something's gonna top it. <laughs> that 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 will be when, and it, and it is a case of when, not if. When that professional women's league comes together, I imagine you and all the other people who are behind the players' association for me, you'll feel such a because that's legacy as well. That is. Yeah, I mean, I hope you know we're we put in a lot of time and a lot of effort and um, given up quite a bit to, to for this fight, but I think you know it'll be all worth it when. You know, those little girls that are looking up to us can play in a professional women's league when they're older and, and have hockey as a career, you know, not just as a hobby or as something that they do on the side. So um, it's all going to be worth it. And, um, you know, we're going to keep fighting until we can make it happen. And it might not be while I'm playing, but hopefully, you know, those that younger generation and those younger girls will um, get a league that uh, they deserve. It also, it also leads to like, what you see it with like the, the women's soccer team over here now, you see you see little boys walking around with Lucy Bronze shirts on because they watched her at the World Cup and she yeah. is awesome. So I want a Lucy Bronze shirt. Mm -hmm. they, there'll yeah, be little boys sure. who want a Natalie Spooner shirt. Yeah, we're, I, like, we're getting a lot more, um, you know, little boy fans too. 
um, boys that, you know, recognize the game. And I think a lot of them come from people who come out to the games and actually watch um, and can see the game live and see um, just how good it is. So I think that, you know, that would be my challenge to people is like, go out and watch a game. Like, like you'll be pleasantly surprised at the speed, at the skill. Um, you know, don't just talk about it and you haven't even watched the game in person. That's the, that's the key, isn't it? Is people will dismiss it before they even go and experience yeah. it. Mm -hmm. have, you felt, have you felt a lot of backlash on that, you know, with the women's sports kind of thing? You know, like personally, I haven't felt too much. Like I've been pretty lucky. I, I grew up playing women's, I mean, women's hockey. Like I wasn't like there was no girls teams when I was growing up. Um, but I know even still like on social media, um, it's pretty bad what, you know, people say. Um, and they can just hide behind their computers and say it. So I do just avoid it um, because they, I just know that they've never seen, you know, me play. They've never seen the girls play uh, and, and really can recognize that talent and see how good the women's hockey has really gotten and just how entertaining it is. I mean, I think, you know, you think of our game and it's, it's a speed, it's a skill game. Yeah, we don't have the body checking, but there's still a lot of contact. And I think if we look at, you know, the guys game and we look at the NHL, I would say their game is almost coming towards our game. You know, there's smaller players, quicker players, more skilled players, less of those, you know, big Brian McGratton type guys who are just out there to hit bodies and fight. So I think that their game is almost coming a little bit more towards the women's game with that speed and that skill um, and, and less body contact. Yeah, as, a, as a question for my own general interest, because I don't know the answer to it, is there a reason that you guys wear the, vi the, the cages instead of the visors? I don't think that there's actually a reason. I just think it's always been that way and we've always worn them since we were little. I know there was some talk of possibly changing it, um, but I just don't think we also have a professional women's league where if we did lose our teeth, like mm. I don't know if we have insurance to cover new teeth. So I think that there's kind of a process before we can, can get to that. Um, but yeah, we've just always worn, worn cages and it's just kind of been like that. <laughs> Is that, that's just a matter of curiosity because I was just wondering well, like, it's the same game why <laughs> why, why not because yeah, we, like, we should think of changing so people can see our faces and stuff but I think it was a little bit adjusting too because you know we're not used to playing with people in visors or stuff like that so I mean down the road it could for sure happen um I think you know once we get a professional league and get that all sorted and have proper insurance and stuff to cover you know any kind of dental damage or face damage I think then would kind of be the moment where maybe the, that would be a conversation. Because yeah, that's what they, they credit the growth of the NBA with. I mean, they've got one of the best commissioners in the world in Adam Silver. He's such a play, a pro players guy, but they're on the court in a vest and shorts and you can see who they are. You can see, mm -hmm. you can see them, right? Whereas, yeah. you, whereas hockey players, even men's hockey players, they're wearing a helmet. You can't really see. Well, then you look at the WNBA and then the girls in that really express themselves about their hairstyles and things like that. It gets crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough thing. It's like our faces are behind cages, so you can't really see who we are um, other than our jerseys, I guess. But yeah, I guess that, that it, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I make one about a week, so I'm all out now. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get people like uh, Shannon Zabados, who's one of your ex-teammates as well. She, mm -hmm. she went and played in the men's league, but as a goalie, she's perhaps got more freedom in that creativity, you know, with the mask and the, and the equipment they get to wear. Yeah, she gets to design her mask pretty cool and her pads and stuff. I mean, I could never be a goalie, but she is an amazing one and, you know, has it just has done so many things for women's hockey and also just, you know, proving that, um, you know, she could play the men's game and the women's game and win Olympics for our team. And, yeah, she's a pretty amazing goalie. I mean, we already established you won't be a goalie. You, you put that out there, not me. No. no. <laughs> so if you could pick a... This is going to be a hard question in a fun way, not a difficult way, because okay. that was all like really serious just then all that, that, that talk. Yeah. What would be your, what's one of your funniest hockey stories, would you say? Oh, oh, this is a good one. Um, I have two really funny hockey stories. I've got time for both of them. <laughs> okay, so one of them happened to me in university. Um, we were playing against Minnesota Duluth, which is just another team in the WCHA, but we were um, in our own end and my goalie lost her stick and it kind of like went to the corner. So I went to go pick it up to bring it back to her. But as I went to pick it up, their player got the puck in the corner and was like almost walking out from the corner to shoot on my goalie. But I was like, uh, you 
no. So I just kind of like was skating back and I turned and kind of like looked like a goalie and she shot it at me and it hit me in the paddle of the stick, the goalie stick. And here I am like holding my stick and the goalie stick, which is like a penalty. And I'm like, and like the ref is staring at me, looking at me like, what is she doing? Like it took, it took him a second to like figure out what was going on. And then I got a penalty. And my coach was like, I didn't even know, I don't even know what to say to you because like, what are the chances of this happening? <laughs> So I was like, well, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. It's just natural reaction for me just to turn around. And as I turned around, she shot it right at me, like as if I was the goalie. Oh dear, that's brilliant. Yeah, it was, I it was bad. That. And then my second one, I think it was probably two years ago, and it was um, the beginning of the season. And it was exhibition, and it was like right off the opening face-off. Uh, I, I don't even know what exactly happened, but I went to go chase. Um, the defense, like they won the face off. So I went to go chase the D uh, as a winger. And all of a sudden, like this Jill is flying through the air. <laughs> and, and then I look down and I'm like, and it was my Jill. <laughs> my Jill had somehow like flung out of my pants, like out of like the holder in my shorts, out of my pants and onto the ice. How is that even possible? <laughs> and it was just sitting on the ice. And luckily it was a brand new Jill. Like I had just gotten it at Team Canada camp, so like it was brand new, but I was like, is that mine? <laughs> like, where did it come from? <laughs> so there weren't a load of you surrounded around that. Who's that, that? No, that's mine, yes. <laughs> I just left it there and then they just brought it back to the bench after. That, that's probably a good decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, social media earlier. You've, you've got your own social media show now. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to stay busy during, you know, coronavirus social distancing. So on Mondays, I've started my big blue quarantine couch, which is just my couch. Um, and I just pretty much, I mean, I do baking, workouts, whatever. And then I have special guests on, um, my teammates. I had my Bow the Blades partner on. Um, yeah, looking to get some other cool people on my show. But I just do that for an hour every Monday. Um, and it's been a lot of fun so far. So Hopefully people are enjoying it. As I, I tuned into this one days with the one you did with Sarah and that was, that was just chaos. It was just complete yeah. chaos. I, I'd love to know where that makeup idea came from. <laughs> um, you know what? It was actually a lady from the UK, I'm pretty sure. It was posted on Instagram and she had her, her husband like, behind her, her makeup. And it was like the funniest thing I'd watched. So I was like, I need to try this. <laughs> well, it definitely, it definitely worked out. Have you, have you enjoyed that as a, like a, because obviously you can be creative on the arts, but have you enjoyed that as like a creative outlet sort of thing? For sure. I mean, I think like the fun thing about it is you have no clue what's actually going to happen because it's all live. Um, like even like when I was baking my bagels, I'm like, I don't know if these are going to work. Like I've never actually baked these types of bagels so far, but they end up working out great. Um, so yeah, I think it's just been a lot of fun and, and, and a way to connect with, I mean, like with Sarah, who's my teammate, my line mate. So just like fun ways to connect and for hopefully people to tune in and get to know us more. And I think that that's also important for growing the women's game is um, for people to realize we're real people. You know, we have personalities where, you know, we might live in your neighborhood, you never know. So I think that uh, it's, it's pretty neat for them to get to know us more off the ice and, and not just, you know, see us playing. I think that's one of the challenges for hockey in general, though, isn't it? Like, like when you grow up in the game of ice hockey, from like just dealing with players, they're so used to being in a team environment, they don't want to stand out as their own thing. So you know, when you find the one person who does, you kind of like, as a media person myself, you kind of like gravitate towards them for interviews and PR projects and things. So it's important that you do show those personalities, like you said. For sure. I mean, I think uh, it also grows the fan base. It gets more people mm -hmm. watching, more people interested. Um, I think there's some pretty amazing like women that I play with who do some pretty amazing things that I wish, you know, they, they brought more attention to it. I think there's still a lot of stories to be told that these ladies have um, of things they've done, of things they're doing. Um, so, you know, hopefully down the road, if we get a professional league, that those are some of the stories that, that we can tell and um, be broadcast and people can fall in love with, you know, all of these players that are playing. And then, what else are you doing to keep busy during this time apart from you? You've got your show on your Mondays and I imagine you, you, your days are littered with workouts and keeping in shape kind of thing. But what else are you keeping occupied with? Yeah, um, I mean, workouts every single day. Um, trying to like stay in, in great shape for when hockey comes back up. Um, lots of, I guess, interviews on Zoom 
lots of trivia nights with friends, um, connecting with family, you know, over Zoom or over FaceTime. Um, it seems to be like pretty busy, even though it's like not busy. <laughs> so it seems to like fill up, even though it's like, I'm just staying at home. Yeah, I've, I've said that ever since our season finished, I seem to be busier than when I had 22 players to deal with. Now, I just, I just nonstop all day. <laughs> yeah, but again, I that, know. Again, that's my fault for booking interviews with, with people on the other side of the world. It means I have to work at like 8, 9 p.m. at night. So. 8 or 9 p.m. right now there? It's 8, 15 p.m. Oh, okay. We're 3.45. Yeah, it's about five hours. Five hours. Of it. I, I, I had this nightmare. I did it in the summer. We were trying, I was trying to arrange a phone call with a goalie we signed. I just could not for the life of me work out the time. It's the same with yeah. this. Like if I open my phone now, I'll see time in Toronto on Google because I've just been swiping down on it to make sure I got yes. the right time and all things like that. So, oh, funny. I do want to thank you for giving up your time for this. This has been, this has been a pleasure. And I want, I would like you to end this on, your fate, on an Olympic story that doesn't involve the gold medal game. If you have a story from the Olympics that doesn't involve the gold medal. Could it be the party after the gold medal? Are you allowed to talk about the party after the gold medal? Yeah, like it wasn't, well, yeah, I can just say, so like after the gold medal game, we got to like, they had like this like NHL lounge underneath the rink after Sochi and we got to go down there. I think I wore my jersey and my Joe the whole night partying. Um, I remember one of the Canadian speed skaters, she brought in just like a giant garbage bag of McDonald's and we had like burgers and chicken nuggets the whole night. Um, and partied there and then I remember like we partied till probably like 9 a.m the next morning and then we went to the village that has another McDonald's and we got McDonald's breakfast <laughs> so pretty much the part after partying was partying and McDonald's oh wow that sounds like my kind of party so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like was- this, this, this has been an absolute pleasure I can't thank you enough for giving up your time for this and I'm sure all the Panthers fans and hockey fans have watched this have, have, have had now an exposure to an international women's ice hockey player. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you for having me on. This is, this is awesome.